podcast. Well, again, thank you very much um, to Luis and Diego for the invitation and the idea of this session, and we're coming close to the end, is to try and make it as relaxed and pleasant as possible. What Luis asked me to do was to uh, show you the late enhancement patterns that we find in cardiac MRI. He was telling me that although you and I work uh, together many times uh, in terms of uh, mapping of arrhythmias and VTs, many times uh, MRI continues to be a relatively distant uh, study if you compare it with catheterization and ICE. We are much... Uh, uh, we are the last kid on the block uh, and we are newer in the neighborhood and there is not the same familiarity as with other techniques. So I'm going to present 10 cases and of those 10 cases I hope uh, that you will learn the basics and that you will have an easier approach to MRI. I have no disclosures to make and the idea is to describe uh, the advantages in morphology, edema and late enhancement, describe the clinical role in the diagnosis and treatment, uh, contemporary cardiology and in clinical EP to always ask you to think outside the box. Uh, always think outside the box. That is very important because not all late enhancement patterns are typical and some take home messages. One of my professors, the same that took two hours giving uh, MRI, told me something that was very true. And it was that cardiac MRI is like real estate. Uh, location, location, location. This is a home in Bora Bora. This is a normal home in any US suburb. This is a home uh, after after the Katrina struck uh, New Orleans. And the cardiac MRI is like real estate because it has to do with image quality, image quality, and image quality. Here you see the perfect quality image. This is one of our MRIs, where there is complete annulment of the myocardium and where you can see a very important scar. This is a case that we will present later on. This is a, a more or less good image. This is an image of mine. When I was a fellow, I had a different uh, um, device. And this is clearly a poor quality image. You can hardly see the two donuts, the donut of the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And simply to remind you, the well, gadolinium is an extracellular contrast medium in myocardial tissue. It comes in and out very quickly. In infarcted tissue or in scars, it remains for a while. And that is the annulment uh, time. Uh, as you can see of the normal tissue, as you can see, this is Raymond Skim, original paper. This is the um, infarcted myocardium with this high intensity signal and the anal, the tissue that has a magnetization of zero and looks completely dark. And that is why we see an infarcted uh, scar tissue, granulomatous tissue, we see high quantities of gadolinium because it has a ha faster magnetization than the null point of normal tissue. This is a correlation between MRI and the histological pattern, the pathological pattern in a dog. We we killed the dog. We had uh, created an infarction previously, and we see how gadolinium correlates almost perfectly with the infarcted tissue. And doctors Kim and Judd, when they were in uh, Northwestern still, published the first uh, paper, and uh, this was almost 18 years ago. And this is one of the typical patterns that you will see in any MRI book, uh, which we constantly review. There's a lot of light. Can we lower the lights uh, up, up here, please? These are the ischemic patterns and subendocardial infarctions, which are not transmural, and they uh, span all the wall of the myocardial tissue. And here we see the non-ischemic ones. So these are two large families, ischemic, subendocardial, or transmural, and non-ischemic, which are the ones on the right. However, and that is why this is one of the take-home messages. Uh, uh, I asked you to think out, but outside the box. Not all transmurals are ischemic, and not all those that are not transmural or not. So in those cases, uh, we will see cases, uh, um, uh, you will see diverse uh, forms of presentation of the patients. First case, this is a real life case, uh, 42 years old, uh, referred for PVC ablation, uh, LVF 45% uh, uh, and the ventricle uh, reported multiple areas of gadolinium at the base, the mid and the apex uh, with subendocardial uh, and mid myocardial distribution. The AP study showed no uh, compatible areas and call Luis called me, he said, my catheters are inside, I'm doing the mapping and I don't see anything. And this is the MRI. Uh, 
Uh, surely there are trained eyes in the audience to see these uh, MRI, but if you were to rate the quality of this image, you would agree with me that there is no annulment, uh, no, not really adequate annulment of the myocardium. Many times the myocardium uh, looks like the tissue of the lung, and there is no enhancement uh, that you can uh, used for diagnosis. So this is not the uh, image quality that you should accept from your uh, uh, colleagues, be they um, uh, radiologists or cardiologists. If you receive these images uh, or if you see that uh, a report doesn't make sense, you need to talk with us for first before you go to the EP live uh, oh, or else you will run into what Luis had to do. He had to cancel the procedure. We checked the MRI and it was completely normal and that changes the approach, uh, the diagnostic approach uh, radically. So, always try not to accept uh, these images uh, and try for the person who is helping you uh, offer you images like this one. This is the first image, uh, the first message I'd like you to take home. Uh, MRI image uh, before any any ablation procedure uh, has to have a very top quality. Sometimes we are not perfect, they don't come up out well. I discuss with Dr. Roa here because I call back the patients and I re-inject with gadolinium because if I don't obtain this quality of image, I'm not doing a good job. It's always teamwork what we need to do. Next patient, everybody needs, does everybody need an MRI, yes or no? This patient is a very good illustration, a 23-year-old patient, a player from Texas University, referred because of uh, abnormal transthoracic echo, no family or personal history of uh, sudden death. Do we have volunteers to describe this? I know you are not ultrasound experts. Is there anything that strikes you in this patient? Patient is completely asymptomatic and simply they did the transthoracic echo because he is a player of the in, the, in Texas. Anything that strikes you? Non-compacted, I think, was uh, what they said here. Dilatation of what? Right ventricular dilatation. So you see a hinge point here with uh, dilatation of the right ventricular apex. Uh, non-compacted myocardiopathy, but the definition of non-compacted myocardiopathy is better described in the right ventricle. But uh, what we haven't seen yet is whether this patient requires an ICD, an EP study, cardiac MRI, a CT8, or just uh, reassurance. Uh, and what we haven't seen is the chest wall of the patient. He has a pectum excavatum, and it is a very frequent cause uh, for patient referral for arrhythmogenic problems. Uh, in patients with abnormal echoes, uh, but by resonance we have known in this patient where they compared 23 patients with pectum excavatum versus 25 normal controls at the morphology of these patients is different. Think about patients without pectum excavatum with a short diameter much higher than in patients uh, with pectum and the opposite. And obviously, obviously the morphology of the uh, ventricle will change significantly if uh, the sternum is compressing, as we saw in the patient. So, so with the physical examination of this patient, we already knew, although it was markedly abnormal echo, there was a mechanical compression, but not a dilatation or a primary abnormality of the right ventricle. The next patient, patient with syncope preceded by fever, malaise, myalgias, and some uh, gen yes, general malaise, uh, family history of polymyositis and comes with a temperature of 101, that's more or less 39 degrees centigrade, and with muscle tenderness. Uh, this is the EKG, which doesn't show any much of an alteration except for an inverted T, symmetrical in V4, V5, V6 in the upper lateral wall, and... Um, uh, CBC normal uh, with troponins and MBs, which are markedly normal. He goes into VT with hemodynamic collapse and is resuscitated in the ER. So next step, we did a CT. You can see the main left, no plaques, the right coronary, the circumflex. It's a normal uh, coronary artery study, which doesn't show anything significant. So his young sudden death preceded by myalgias and a febrile pick 
picture. This is the EKG, the IC. We don't see uh, contractility issues, and neither do we see segmental disorders of contractility. And this is a four chamber apical view. And the next uh, step uh, was precisely to take him to cardiac MRI. And this is a comparison of the four chambers between echo and MRI. We see that the lateral wall looks better. And when we look at the delayed enhancement, we see these subepicardial areas throughout the lateral wall. From the middle third up to the apex, uh, representing uh, what the patient has in particular, when we get together the clinical findings with the MRI findings, so we find uh, that the subepicardial and mesocardial findings uh, usually are shared by these four diseases, mesocardial and epicardial, usually sarcoidosis, myocarditis, Anderson's or Chagas, uh, depending on the clinical context and on other abnormalities that we see. This was the MRI. This is the four-chamber apical view uh, with what I already described uh, with a very good match of what I was telling you about, uh, about the roadmap uh, that we get from the differentiation between ischemic and non-ischemic. And this is a paper I like very much because it tells us about the usefulness of MRI in patients who come with malignant arrhythmias. Uh, basically, 82 patients who were uh, who had aborted sudden death uh, or monomorphic VT who were taken to MRI after all the workup was done. In their case, all of them, the 82 of them, were taken to transesophageal echo, some uh, coronariography, and uh, look how the diagnosis changes before and after the MRI. These are diagnoses without MRI and this with MRI. And uh, these categories are normal before coronary disease without left dysfunction, coronary disease with uh, uh, left, ven left ventricular dysfunction, uh, idiopathic and inflammatory. These, which were normal, when dropped by one half. There was a significant increase in the number of subendocardial infarctions that do not give rise to important alterations of the ejection fraction, but can be detected by MRI. And you can see that the inflammatory is increased significantly, which is very similar to the patient I just told you, patients who come acutely. And under the inflammatories, we can also include sarcoidosis. Very, very important. One thing is to see the patient with uh, angiography, with nuclear medicine, catheterization, and a completely different thing is to put uh, the patient in the magnet and characterize the myocardium as we can do with late enhancement and the sequences. So this is our pattern. We are going to be looking at it uh, throughout the presentation. And this is the ischemic pattern, which was uh, first described by Kim and Judd uh, after the initial Initially in dogs, they went to Duke Medical Center. These are transmural infarcts of the descending, anterior descending. Not even one bit of anal the tissue. Uh, all this tissue is infarcted. And here, uh, a subendocardial infarction of the circumflex. And here, an inferior infarction, which uh, is the one with the shortest extent. This is the distribution of the ischemic tissue. Ischemic subendocardial, it may be very small, as the one I showed you here, or a bit larger, or it could be transmural, as the one that we see here. The same researchers from Harvard, Brigham, and NGH found something similar aboard cardiac sudden death uh, taken to MRI, and uh, they found hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy, sarcoidosis, myocarditis, and many had the same pathologies uh, when the diagnosis was not clear and had not been known previously. So in those patients whom you are uh, consulted uh, for sudden death, it's good to take them to the magnet in order to have a more accurate diagnosis. Something else uh, we use is uh, black blood sequences. This is a patient with myocarditis. This is a black blood uh, sequence, the blood looks black, that's why it takes the name. This is a sh uh, bright blood. Here we see edema, and here we see the scar. If you look at the two, there's edema and scar, and these are findings that we can uh, have in patients with myocarditis. So the advantages are excellent temporal resolution, as is the case here, excellent uh, endocardial contour. This is dubutamin stress study, with where at 10, 20, 30, and 40, we don't see problems of windows. There's no poor windowing here. Those problems that we frequently have in the laboratory are over because we see the contour perfectly well. And aside for the gadolinium resolution for the contour, 
and the edema. These are three of the advantages, and that's another take-home message, because in that way, we uh, help you, you help us, in order to offer the patient the best of diagnosis. So in patients with sudden cardiac death, in which the diagnostic workup has not provided clarity about the diagnosis, uh, cardiac MRI is extremely useful and can give us a differential diagnosis in 76 to 86 percent of cases. Next patient, 44 year old female, chest pain after sore throat, no history of coronary artery disease, and she was the, my boss's wife. Kind of difficult patient. My boss was an interventional cardiologist and he was watching over my shoulder. This is the EKG, relatively normal with some repolarization disorders. Somebody could say that there is an ACT in the lateral aspect, but there wasn't an acute coronary event. And this is the initial troponin and CPK and uh, CMV, when we saw this with my interventional cardiologist uh, boss, he said, it can't be that my wife is having an infarction. We repeated them, and they were increasing. So what was the next uh, step? What do you think was the next step uh, uh, for the interventional cardiologist, uh, my boss's wife, uh, who comes to ask me what to do next? What do you think he did? Catheterization? No, no. He, he didn't dare to. No, she wasn't taken to the cath lab, so we did uh, a CT, which was completely normal, and this is the um, eye, uh, the ultrasound, uh, this is the apical view of the LVOT, and this is the apical with two. What do you see there? Anybody who wants to volunteer to make it more interactive? Is this an abnormal or normal echocardiogram? It is abnormal, indeed. Uh, the contractility, what you see in the ventricle is contrast, uh, uh, but there is a segmental contractility disorder here, very significant. Another very important contractility alteration here. And and over here also a contractility uh, alteration. So she had chest, she had sore throat, uh, she had some fever. She came uh, with this that looks like takatsu. The problem is that epidemiologically it doesn't l appear to be a takatsu, but she's a young woman, 44. So we did a CTA, it was normal. And after that we performed an MRI and this was done two days later, and here you can see something about the segmental alterations of the contractility. And here you can see the two-chamber apical view with some contractility alterations, and this is the late enhancement. And you can see that there is mesocardial apical distribution in the same place that she, where she had uh, the alterations of contractility. So this is another case. Uh, no, she's 44, not 54. No, no, sorry, this is the next case. So another patient with myocarditis. Different from the first case I presented because the clinical presentation was not the same. We published this a few years ago. This was a post-streptococci myocarditis. The next patient, 54 years old, chest pain and positive troponins. Usually, these patients are referred to us, to the MRI lab. This is a two-chamber apical view. We don't see much contractility disorder. This is the D4 apical. We see diffuse distortion in the way it contracts in the aspect of the infralateral wall. This is a D4 apical view with reduced uh, enhancement uptake. This is the late uh, enhancement. We see here mesocardic and epicardic deposits in the lateral and lower wall. This is another case of myocarditis, very similar to the first one, and to see the quality of the image. This is the first image I told you. There is a regular enhancement of the myocardium. It improves a bit, and this is a case of the fundacion. This is perfect enhancement with very high intensi intensity signal. So these are three spectrum of myocarditis with different imaging qualities, but the MRI was definitely crucial. A key question. Uh, one of our fellows uh, gave a lecture prior to mine because myocarditis can be transmural. One of the cases that Carlos Tapia will show later is that myocarditis can be transmural, and that's very important because according to the book I showed you initially, myocarditis 
is classified as mesocardic or subepicardic, but there are specific cases, particularly giant cells myocarditis, where late enhancement ha might have a larger extension. Therefore, not all patients follow the necessary patterns of late enhancement. This is a patient, 52-year-old female, admitted due to a typical CP, uh, no history of hypertension. The ECG is marked abnormal with increased uh, voltage and asymmetric negative T wave in most leads. And this is the ECG. There is an increased thickness of the anteroceptive wall. We didn't have the best window. It was 19 millimeters. There is a murmur. And there is aliasing in the outflow tract of the left ventricle with mitral uh, insufficiency, which is typical of uh, these patients. Here we measured 18. And the intraventricular gradient was 44 millimeters, which increased to 93 with Valsalva. The right ventricle was also compromised with a thickness of 10 millimeters. We don't see the measurement here. We place her under the magnet. We see in a more detailed manner the uh, endocardic ridge. And in the ECG, the thickness was 18, and now it's 22 for the wall. The Italian trial that I will show in a few minutes of the thickness of the wall depends the prognosis of the patient. And we know, due to the trials in the 90s, that the ECG may underestimate the real thickness of the ventricle. This is very important to be kept in mind. This is the SPIRITU trial, 17 years old, but it shows in patients that with over 30 in the systolic, the prognosis of these patients is marked abnormal. Recently, Martin Maurer's group in Boston described that in 1,293 patients, the amount of late enhancement can also be very important in uh, stratifying patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the more hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the larger or the uh, higher the number of events. This is a classic paper of hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. This is the history of the disease as uh, a routine. We are using hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in most of our patients. How many of you use enhancement in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to stratify patients? If a patient comes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, who uses the scar to decide whether you use a defibrillator or not? Está repitiéndole la pregunta al doctor Natale. So not everybody is using it. Maybe it's because of the availability of the MRI, but in many patients, we think it's important. The next patient, 67 years old, chest pain, normal coronaries, once again, uh, normal reference ratio. This ventricle definitely is thickened. This is the three-chamber apical, but the thickness of this ventricle is not uniform. The inferolateral wall may be normal, but in the middle third and in the apex, it's markedly hypertrophic. So this is not a typical hypertrophy of uh, high blood pressure. It's rather a different condition. And probably we can see it better here. This is the inferoceptal wall and the anterolateral wall preserved. But there is marked thickening in the middle third of both walls. And look at the measurement of the wall here. It's 19 millimeters. Here it's 7, 14, and 2. So this is an atypical case. We took the patient for late re-enhancement. And look at the localization of the late enhancement areas where the left ventricle joins the right ventricle in the insertion sites of the right ventricle of the interventricular septum. These are the two areas that we saw in the patient. A friend of mine who works for Brockton uh, sent me a number of hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathies with late enhancement. They say they are extremely, uh, they glitter. The glitter is exaggerated here at 10 a.m. and at, se uh, at 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. These areas are particularly shiny, and this is one of the typical characteristics of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy when we place these patients under the magnet. This is uh, the hard access uh, 
And we see that from the very beginning, there is enhancement. We continue moving forward towards the heart. And definitely, there is more enhancement in these areas, which are the critical areas in this type of cardiomyopathies. These patients may, or this type of distribution may also be present in patients with right ventricle with increased arterial pressure. This was the description that Diego gave me once, uh, dilatation of the right atrium, no increase in the thickness of the left ventricle, but we saw areas similar to these. And of course, this is not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is increased pressure in the right ventricle because in the areas of insertion of the ventricle, the ventricle fibrosis pulling the septum, and that's why there is an increase in the late enhancement. The next patient, 54 years old, acute chest pain, normal coronaries. The TT shows an apical thickening referred for MRI. Here we see that the thickness has increased. It's more apical. And uh, an important characteristic is that it has hypokinesis and apical aneurysm. You can clearly see it over here at the end of the contraction. Part of the endocardium is not contracting properly. The measurement is 17 in the apex and 10, and 10 in the enterobasal level. Uh, here we can see this is an early enhancement with no evidence of thrombus. And the late enhancement shows transmural distribution of an MI, which may occur in patients with apical hypertrophic cardiopathy. Uh, this is very important because Barron and his son published this year the prognosis of patients with hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy and apical aneurysm. And these patients have more adverse events. <clears throat> and the statistical significance was mostly in arrhythmic events. So if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with apical aneurysm with very important enhancement, those patients have to be stratified differently because they will have more events. Four more cases, patient number seven. History of coronary artery disease, pre-syncope, tachybridae, tachycardia and bradycardia were present. And I need another volunteer to tell me what is the diagnosis. <clears throat> Do you see any specially normal in this uh, patient? There is increased apical tissue. Is this hypertrophic uh, heart disease? There are some areas of hyperechogenicity. Any volunteers? Well, this could be apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There is more tissue in this area. No, not compacted, that's not the case because we don't see increased trabeculation of the left ventricle. We simply see more tissue. We use late enhancement and the patient has uh, endomyocardic fibrosis. This is a typical description. This is a patient we had a couple of months ago here at the Fundacion, and we can see enhancement in these areas, these subendocardic areas. And this picture was very similar to the one we saw before. This is a tropical disease, and it is particularly important because we are close to Venezuela. And this is present in Central Africa, Western Africa. And the last few years, we have had three patients with this condition, my endomyocardic fibrosis. And the MRI in these patients is absolutely crucial for the diagnosis. Patient number eight, 59 years old, male history of stroke, the transthoracic uh, echo with a poor acoustic window and uh, normal coronaries. And this is the two-chamber view in the VOT and the four apical projection. Here we see an apical aneurysm, and here an infralateral aneurysm with reduced uh, anatomy. Do you? Th this is similar to Chagas. Yes, exactly. This is Chagas disease. Here is the enhancement, aneurysm, and transmural distribution. So you now know which is the diagnosis. Can Chagas disease have transmural enhancement? And the answer is yes, definitely Chagas may have transmural enhancement. Let me go back 
I forgot to copy that slide here, Chagas. Sarcoidosis, myocarditis, and Chagas are reported at mesocardic enhancement and subepicardial enhancement. But we are here in a follow-up of 36 patients. Most patients have a distribution in the uh, inferior lateral wall and in the apex. Most of the cases we see are transmural. There is a Chagas clinic in UCLA, and definitely the distribution of Chagas, at least where we see Chagas the most, which is in Latin America, is not as frequent. And we see a lot of transmural distribution. I'm sorry for skipping a few slides. Case number eight. Coronary disease is a frequent differential diagnosis because these patients may have uh, mid-LAD uh, infarction or an occlusion of the circumflex. So it's important to rule out any of these two conditions for Chagas disease. 50-year-old male, Greek uh, parents admitted due to uh, sudden death during sleep married to a nurse who resuscitated the patient, and we placed the patient under the magnet, and this is the image. This is a courtesy of Bronton. Well, you guess the Chagas, another diagnosis. Do you see anything abnormal in the contractility of the ventricle? Dysplasia. This patient has aneurysms in the basis, particularly in the middle third and in the anterior apex. And not just dysplasia or aneurysm in the right ventricle, but there is also there are also aneurysms in the left ventricle. This wall is not contracting properly. This wall is not contracting properly either. And this was initially described in Italy. Uh, late enhancement has a diffuse uh, scatter of displacement in the right ventricle, a relatively easy diagnosis to make. Take hope messages, excellent space resolution. You can see this uh, inferoceptal scar, excellent endocardic resolution. We don't have the window problems and the ability to diagnose edema. Don't accept poor quality MRIs because you will be in trouble, as it happened to me when I was trying to diagnose this case. This should be the quality of image expected from us. And if you don't have a good quality image, probably the time uh, will be longer in the lab and you will have further complications and unexpected events. Remember the usefulness of sudden death. How do we redistribute and reclassify patients? We are in our take-home messages uh, slides, and half of the patients that were normal in the widest circulation trial stopped being normal. Uh, a lot of subendocardial infarctions uh, started to occur, and many inflammatory conditions as well that could not be diagnosed otherwise. These patterns are not always as they are shown on the chart. Chagas disease, sarcoidosis, and myocarditis may also have transmural infarction, and Carlos will show you a couple of patients about that. I already showed the Chagas case. It's very important to work as a team. This is what we do with the electrophysiology laboratory. If they are not happy with the report or the images, they call us and they ask for clarification. Or they say, I disagree with this. And we try to help each other in order to have the best patient care. And basically, that's all. Thank you.